You are listening to Woodland Walks, a podcast for the Woodland Trust, presented by Adam Shaw. We protect and plant trees for people, for wildlife. Well, today I'm meeting a broadcaster who presents one of the most famous shows on BBC Radio 4, Gardener's Question Time, or GQT, to its fans. And she is Cathy Clugston. Until recently, she was a newsreader and continuity announcer. And together, we used to present on Radio 4 in the very, very early mornings. Well, I spoke to her about her broadcasting career, her love of the outdoors, and what it was like working with me at 4am. And when she spoke to me, she was doing it from her home in Northern Ireland. And I began by asking her how she got into the BBC. I mean, like many people, um, I guess of my age, I suppose of our age rather than yeah. now, um, it was sort of a, a, a collection of happy circumstances. There was actually a job advertised at BBC Northern Ireland which for an, a TV announcer, which is where I started. And that was an extraordinary event. I mean, I think you get one of those adverts every 60 years. When, you know, I hadn't the requisite experience, but I sort of bluffed my way in. And I'll tell you what I did, which I always advise other people to do, even now, is I went in. I actually went into the BBC and just said, could I just watch for the morning and see what goes on in here? As it happened, you know, the boss of the department was was there and sort of heard me, heard the questions that I was asking and what I was doing and sort of thought, ah, she sounds like she, you know, knows kind of gets it yeah. and so in the end it turned out when my application came in he said look this girl hasn't got enough experience but I've met her so put her in for a voice test right. so that was one amazing kind of right. person helping me out the second amazing person helping me out was many years later I'd left the BBC I'd gone to Holland to work in radio there just for something to do and there was a, I fancied a job at well a job came up at radio four so I had a bit more experience this time. So I sent in a CD and a letter explaining my experience and uh, my work at Radio Netherlands and all of that. It turned out the, C- the letter went missing. The CD turned up on Harriet Cass's desk. Thankfully, I'd put my email address on it. I don't know how I'd, I'd put my name and my email address on the CD. And she emailed me and said, I've got the CD. Who are you, please? What, what's going on? <laughs> and um, anyway, long story short, I came for an interview I didn't get the job, but I was taken on as a freelancer and that was sort of 15 years ago or so. And then I've been there ever since. So, you know, luck has played a, a part. For that, it's similar to my, I applied for a, uh, a production trainee job at the BBC. It was quite a posh trainee. And oh, I great. did get it. And, yeah. Uh, but I did get, similar to you, a tour of the BBC. Mm. And this guy was showing me around and I ran away from him <laughs> and ran into the office of the editor of The Late Show. Do you remember The Late Show? It was sort of yeah, office. yeah. And I just, I burst in and went, I need work. Can wow. I work? And I remember he was just filing and I could, all I could see was his bum. And he just looked, <laughs> looked and went, what, what? And he went, yeah, all right, come in tomorrow. You can work for nothing. If you want to work for nothing, you can work here for a week. And the man who was showing me around was apoplectic. Um, but I sort of just forced my way into the building. So that does it seem happens. to be a thing. There is a thing. And I think it's more difficult now. I just think, it, you know, it was a bit it was a bit easier back then where it was just a bit more casual and, um, you know, probably not. That's not yeah. a good thing, but it was good. It happened to be good for us. But I think now, even now, I always tell sort of young folk who are like how, they've got media training, but they're like, how do I get into a job? I think you've got to make connections. You've got, I think, Adam, what it is, is showing people that A, you're willing and B, not completely insane. Yes. And then they'll more or less if you've got the skill, you need to have the skills that's yeah. sort of taken as red. But if you can demonstrate that you're a decent human, then, you know, you've, that really helps. I have to say, I mean, we know each other because uh, we've well, crossed paths many times. But I think yeah. I always remember, especially when I was doing the Today programme. Uh, and I have to say to everyone, you are perhaps the nicest person I've ever met. <laughs> um, you haven't, you mustn't have met too many people. Uh, you've been I, in that I, house uh, too long, Adam. And, I, and it takes something because I always thought, I always remember listening, oh, Farming Today. Farming Today is like on at 5.30 or something like <laughs> mad in the morning. And I always thought, well, I'm never going to be up early enough to listen to that. And I ended up being on on air before that was on. <laughs> I would like meet you at four o'clock in the I morning know. and you would hand over to me. How I even managed to be civil is, is a miracle. Very nice to me. Very nice. It makes a difference at four in the morning. <laughs> and I remember one time. We were, we were in the studio together doing the 4.30 news or something. And um, the producer came in and started talking to me. And I looked at him and thought, 
we're on air. What are you talking about? Why are you here? And he went, oh, no, we fell off air. Um, <laughs> but nobody had bothered to tell me. And I did think oh. for a moment, am I just in some sort of scheme where actually I've never been broadcasting and this is just a, a sort of care in the community project where they go let him this man <laughs> comes in he, we pretend he's on air <laughs> and anyway so I do remember that your time uh, very fondly very fondly you are a wonderful woman um, <laughs> and I was so pleased then when to see something quite dramatic because there are lots of great people uh, reading the news and, and doing continuity and presentation on the networks but you are perhaps unique I mean you really have broken out of that as well you now present one of the cornerstones of BBC broadcasting been around forever yeah government's question time how did that happen well Adam I, I still I'm not really sure um it was quite extraordinary so I uh Eric Robson was retiring um and they were looking around for a placement and somehow my name came up the only thing i can really think of is that i had had a few connections with the program so occasionally they'd ask me to come and read things out often as announcers were asked to come and read things out on other programs so i'd been on a couple of editions reading out like a christmas show reading out funny letters or whatever and then i wrote a sort of a funny shipping forecast for one of their anniversaries so i i kind of knew the team a little bit um and I don't know. I, I, I'm really not sure what went on behind the scenes, but I had a coffee with the um, executive producer and I thought he was going to say, would you write a funny poem for Eric's leaving? That's what I thought he'd ask, ask me for coffee for. So he went through this very long, he talked a lot about the programme and what was happening with and what they, you know, their vision for it going, you know, into the yeah. future and all of that. And I, I sort of waiting, waiting, waiting for what he was going to say. And he just said, so I wondered, would you like to be considered to present it? And I, just was like what were you talking about um so after I sort of you know closed my mouth I um I said well yes of course I of course I would be con con willing to be considered so there was a long audition process I think I don't know how many people they saw nine or ten I think and we all did a little mini um sort of mini program in you know just in-house with with a few people in the audience and a couple of panelists um, and then after a long and tortuous wait, they they offered me the job. So I still, to this day, I'm not quite sure how it, how it happened, how or why. But I think the other advantage I had was that um, I was known to the listeners, you know, Radio 4 yeah. listeners knew me, they would trust me, and they probably would be forgiving of the fact that I'm obviously not, a, not an expert gardener. I'm very much coming from the interested amateur <laughs> angle. I've had plants and pots and, and window boxes, but, you know, I don't have the luxury of a, of a lovely, of rolling acres, you know. And so people, the papers, when I, they first announced that I got the job, were quite snooty about it, you know. They were like, she hasn't even got a garden. And I just thought, well, you know, lots of people don't have a garden. That, 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 that's something to do with it um and then um you know as obviously as lockdown then came the importance of sort of home gardening and gardening in any kind of little space that you had became so important that that you know it's really it's really kind of come into its own now so we're getting lots of younger listeners first-time listeners people who are just taking up growing a few herbs in a pot or something and well, you, you spent a lot of time of your career in London in, in flats but you're, you've now gone back home yeah. to Northern Ireland Yes, I went home to Northern Ireland about two years ago. Luckily, radio being the medium it is, it's been possible to do Gardener's Question Time from home. So all the programmes that you've heard since March have been from this little, my little spare room. And and when you talked about the importance of getting out during lockdown and how people mm. connected with their gardens. And what's your sort of connection? I mean, I'm a sort of city boy. I go to yeah. parks, but I never really lived in the countryside. If, are you much the same? Or? Me too. To totally a city girl. Uh, uh, although growing up in Northern Ireland, you're not that far from the countryside. That's the great thing about here and something that I am sort of re-exploring, having uh, been a bit sneering in my youth. I wasn't interested really in the countryside when I was young, like many young people um, as a city girl. Uh, but always was dragged around the parks and uh, forest parks and mountainous areas in my childhood. And I'm sure lots of your guests have said this, where it's the most boring thing in the world to be dragged for walks when you're a child. But of course, you look back and you think, well, thank goodness I was, because somewhere it's building a foundation somewhere, isn't it? Where for you to appreciate the, the outdoors and love it. So always I was dragged to the Moor Mountains, which I now absolutely love. And there's some beautiful forest parks in that area. And where I live in Belfast is um, I'm extraordinarily lucky. Right by I'm right by the River Lagan. And there's a beautiful towpath along there, which you can do different sections of 
absolutely stunning, you know, um, as if you're in the middle of nowhere with foresty areas and the, the beautiful river and lovely trees. And it's absolutely gorgeous. So I'm there a lot. And of course, the local parks, I'm r- right beside, um, well, I'm five minutes walk from the park that I used to go to as a child. And you've done a recording for us from a, a walk from that in, in that park. Is that right? Yeah, well, I just thought it's nice to hear the when we're talking about the outdoors, it's nice to hear the outdoors, isn't it? I mean, Zoom is brilliant, but you're kind of it's so, yeah, I went I took my little recorder with me um, on Sunday and, and went for a walk in the park. Well, let's ha- let's have a listen. It's Sunday afternoon in Belfast. I'm in my local park. Must be near at freezing today. It's so cold. And there's a really thick fog, but it's actually very beautiful. Any direction you look, you're faced with a a Turner painting. Do I mean Turner? I think I do. The trees are dark strokes against the white hazy background. And there's a big white moon up above. This is Ormo Park in the south of the city. It's the oldest public park in Belfast. It was part of the Donegal family estate in the late 1800s, but they fell on hard times apparently and had to sell it. So Belfast Corporation snapped it up and it was open to the public in 1871 to great fanfare. Well, I've been coming to this park on and off for 50 years. That sounds crazy when you say it out loud. My mum used to wheel me through here as a baby and uh, later I was a big fan of the children's play area though not on a Sunday, because the uh, swings were tied up. That was Northern Ireland in the 70s. Fun was not encouraged. I did try, though, as a teenager. I used to sneak away on the the pretext of going for a walk uh, and come to the park and meet a boy. I'm sure my parents knew exactly what was going on. The park is huge, and there are lots of different bits. There are big grassy areas with uh, wide walkways. And there are lots of little meandering paths. There are playing fields here, areas for bedding plants, which always look really immaculate. Though you never see any gardeners. I don't know when they're tended to, but they always look lovely. And of course, there are hundreds of trees. In here somewhere is an oriental plain from the Balkans. And there are willows from China and Lebanese cedars and North American maples. Lots of big oak trees, as you'd expect. And we have lots of ash and beech and chestnut trees. And now I've reached my favourite section. It's an area beside the road, which you can probably hear, uh, which is a woodland area. And if it weren't for that traffic, you would honestly think you're in the middle of a forest. There are usually uh, not very many people here because people don't know this little bit. Um, it's right beside the embankment, so the River Lagan is running right beside. And uh, a real mixture of trees. A lot of them bare, obviously, at this time of year, but a few uh, maple leaves and elder leaves clinging on. Lots of lime trees here, and there are loads of limes actually in the adjacent streets. And my street, actually, which is about five minutes away, is also lined with lime trees. And you've got a bit of uh, winter interest, the ivy up the trunks and the odd pine and some holly bushes. I moved back to Belfast from London about two years ago. and I think I've been in this park virtually every day uh, during the pandemic. Do you remember right at the beginning there was, um, we were only allowed out once a day for exercise. That seems so long ago, doesn't it now? Well, this is where I came uh, along with the whole neighbourhood and we all walked briskly and purposefully, uh, very serious faces, spaced very far apart, swerving like mad. Now it's a bit more joyful and relaxed, I must say. Very busy uh, now, especially at the weekend, with families and uh, joggers and dog walkers. And on Sundays, there's often a ukulele band playing just up here. So nice, there's a, even a group of older people line dancing, all socially distanced. Oh, it'll keep them warm. 
Uh, the ice cream van isn't doing much business today. I always feel great in this park. I feel rooted, I suppose, like one of these old oak trees. We all know, I think, how important outdoor space is. I have a tiny bit of garden, but plenty around here don't have any gardens. And to be able to have a good long walk among the trees and to see green everywhere and birds, it's so heartening and bolstering. I'm so grateful to have this park on my doorstep and to be able to come here every day. And, uh, well, really to have got to know it over these last months. I love it. I really do. Well, that was amazing. You came across a ukulele band. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I should like, mention, Adam, I should, I should mention, which I didn't there, that they were all in masks and standing far apart. Everything was all socially distanced. Um, that's Is the that kind of thing that happens in the park. Is that a common thing? In, uh, are ukuleles a big thing in Northern Ireland? Yes. Well, they're a big thing everywhere, Adam. Where have you been? Actually, now I say that, have I not seen you with the ukulele? Is that, <laughs> yes, I do, is that I... just a mad dream? No, no, that wasn't one of these Truman Show experiences. I do actually play the ukulele quite badly. But um, uh, yes, I do uh, occasionally dabble. And in fact, once John Humphreys, um, I made the mistake of letting John Humphreys know that because... Right. Some members of the ukulele orchestra of Great Britain were coming in and I said to him, could I just sit in? Because I absolutely love them. They're a fantastic ensemble, if you've never heard of them, the UOGB. Yeah. And uh, so John said, well, why are you interested? I said, oh, I play. I said, but I'm really I'm not I'm only a beginner. Please don't mention that. I just want to hear them. And so, of course, the minute the interview started, he was like, well, our newsreader, Kathy Claxton, plays the ukulele and made one of them give me a ukulele and made me play live on the Today programme. I've never got over it. <laughs> and it's an, an unusual instrument to pick up. Um, <laughs> is there a story behind that? Why the ukulele and not the trumpet or the flute? <laughs> well, I used to play the flute in my youth. And it's actually just a friend. Mine was who's a guitarist, had, had got hold of a ukulele. This was before they became, they're quite trendy now. And this was before then, some years ago. And then they were really cheap then, you know, they're 10 quid. So we bought a couple and he just taught me and we started to play. And then I've just sort of kept it going. And now it's there's actually a huge movement of right. ukulele players. They play them in schools now instead of recorders, which I think is a great thing. So look, you clearly like going out into the park and everything. Have you found going out, I mean, something just, is it just a bit of exercise? Nice to get a bit of fresh air? Is it something a bit more than that to you? Yeah, it's quite a, I think it's quite a, a primal thing almost. I mean, before lockdown, when I lived in London, what I used to do was, obviously there are beautiful parks in London. I lived about 40 minutes walk from work, which was really lucky. So I always used to walk. So I could walk different ways and maybe through Regent's Park. And I suppose I wasn't really paying that much attention. I'm just aware that I'm outside. I'm surrounded by greenery. And I suppose I just felt good. If I had a day off, I would. I had this brilliant book of time out walks, country walks near London, I think it's called or something. And it's brilliant. You, you get a train and it's always less than an hour's journey. And then there's a circular walk of about maybe 10 miles or 15 miles that would take you beautifully planned. So it would take you past a lunch, a pub where you could have lunch. And then on the back leg, you'd pass a lovely tea shop where you could have <laughs> tea and buns. So I used to do these a lot. So I used to just head off with my book and, and do those. And I suppose um, what I was doing was de de-stressing and, and emptying my mind, I suppose, of work and city life. And lockdown obviously was, such an opportunity to really embrace that and so I've been out every day and I try and because I work sort of from in my own time most of the time I, I find now I tend to try and get out in the day when there's some daylight and then I'll maybe work late afternoon into the evening that just suits me best because I think it's so important to try and just get outside if you can. Um, yeah. no, I mean look I, I don't know uh, Northern Ireland very well at all I've been to Belfast a couple of times but nothing mm. like that so I do intend, when things loosen up a bit, to come over. I invite you, Adam. I invite you. Please Thank come. You. Thank you. Um, and uh, where it, are good places to go then? The, the forest, or you, you've given us a bit of insight into sort of the park nearby and the sort of yeah. river, but where are the other big places you think people should visit? In North well, North? if you were to come and stay with me, you or anyone else, I would take you. Yes, I would we, do it. Careful do here. <laughs> You don't invite everybody. I thought this was a special invitation. Now, I'm sorry. Stay with Kathy. 
I'm sure yes. you, you can't have everyone staying with you. If oh, you go to Northern Ireland and stayed in yes. that hotel or an Airbnb. Obviously, you couldn't yeah. stay in my house anyway. I've only got this one tiny spare room and it's full of recording equipment. So okay. that just would not happen. But anyway, if you were to come in and I were to be your guide, yeah. I would certainly show you around the Belfast area, the lagoon that I've mentioned, some of the beautiful parks. Where the two places, I suppose, that are top would be the Mourne Mountains and the North Antrim Coast. So the Mourns are in County Down. Um, south of Belfast, about maybe 45 minutes an hour's drive. Beautiful area, um, beautiful woodland there to explore. And the mountains, of course, which are pretty, they're not for the faint hearted. They're, <laughs> they're pretty mean, but absolutely gorgeous. You've got, um, well, you might know the song with the mountains of Moor and Sweep Down to the Sea. You know, you've just got beautiful scenery everywhere you look. That That is a must see for walkers. Um if you are not so much of a hiker and maybe just, you know, want some beautiful scenery, the North Coast is where the Giant's Causeway is. And most people have heard of that. That's an absolute must see if you've never seen it. There are also some other beautiful parts of that um, coast to see some fantastic walking. Um, I mean, that that's that would be my starting point. And then there are lots of other. There's some beautiful National Trust properties. Mount Stewart is um, within half an hour of Belfast. Absolutely gorgeous gardens there. Um, Roe Allen is in Belfast. I mean, there's just so much to say. It's a very green, you know, it's a very green island, as you know, because of the amount of rain we get here. So it, you'd never tire. You could spend many a happy month here. Fantastic. Now, you, you present Gunners Question Time, but you also do a, a local radio uh, programme as well. Tell me a quick bit about that. Yes, I do. It's a. It's called The Ticket. It's on Radio Ulster on Thursday evening. It's an entertainment show, really. So again, that has had to evolve. It was like, if you imagine sort of like a loose ends type format, it was the studio full of guests performing. So singers, you know, actors, musicians. Um, and then lockdown came and we couldn't have any guests. So we slightly thought, oh, we've got no show. But again, people have been extraordinarily creative and um, using Zoom and various other forms, audio you know sending audio in and stuff we've managed to keep the show going so we're featuring some of the amazing uh, local artists Kathy, one of the nicest people at the bbc uh Stop it. more power to your elbow thank you very <laughs> much for that and uh everyone in listen will be knocking on your door shortly for a guided tour yes. around north island's voice a, <laughs> a bad promise to make Kathy. thank you very much thanks adam well if you're ever in kathy's neck of the woods Cave Hill might interest you. Now, the Woodland Trust is buying it, and that will mean that all 247 acres of the land will eventually be fully accessible to the public, and that's the first time, I think, that's ever happened. They plan to plant 150,000 native trees, and they include things like hazel, cecil, oak, rowan, crabapple, willow, and alder, and lots more. That will be coming in the future, but if you are in Northern Ireland, you can see what's happening with the Woodland Trust there on the Woodland Trust website. Until we meet next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Woodland Trust Woodland Walks with Adam Shaw. Join us next month when Adam will be taking another walk in the company of Woodland Trust staff, partners and volunteers. Don't forget to subscribe to the series on iTunes or wherever you're listening to us and do give us a review and a rating. And why not send us a recording of your favourite woodland walk to be included in a future podcast? Keep it to a maximum of five minutes and please tell us what makes your woodland walk special. Or send us an email with details of your favourite walk and what makes it special to you. Send any audio files to podcast at woodlandtrust.org.uk We look forward to hearing from you.